to me, I will not start a horse that isn't correct in the trapezoid. If a horse's trapezoid isn't correct, for one thing, he's going to break down. He's not going to stay sound. It, you know, a horse, training a horse is very mental. Uh, if a horse starts hurting and he gets sore, he's going to dread his job. And a great horse with a big heart, when he gets sore, he'll still try for you, but he'll dread it. You know, and, and if the trapezoid isn't correct, they're not going to you're not going to keep them from getting sore. And what a trapezoid is, is from your wither to your croup, and from your wither to the point of the shoulder, and from the croup to the point of the hip. Those three measurements should all be the same. And then your under measurement from the point of the hip to the point of the shoulder should be exactly double of any one of those measurements. That's a correct trapezoid. There's one other measurement that goes in there, but I won't call a horse for it. And that is if you measure from the point of the wither to the pole, right where the neck starts from the skull, that, in, that, that measurement to be in perfect balance should be uh, the same as the back, the shoulder, and the hip. If they're a little, if it's, if, if they're a little longer there, it, they're still going to have a lot of lateral turn, but they're going to have more sweep. Uh, if they're a little shorter in that measurement, those real short neck torsos get pretty dirty with their shoulders. Like when you ask one to roll back, you had better sit down. Because, you know, them little short neck torsos, they get a little dirty in, with their shoulders. Uh, but I kind of like that, so that don't bother me that much, and I love the, the other end of So the neck deal, I wouldn't call one for you. It's just you're going to get one style or the other. But the body, that's everything. But here's where people get in trouble. Uh, I, I know when I first learned that theory and I first started studying it and try, trying to uh, find, Don Burke is, is the guy that, that brought that to my attention many, many years ago. And at the time he told me about it, I was riding a horse named Hyperf. And I told Don, I said, Don, I can blow your theory all to heck. I said, I, I'm probably riding one of the greatest open horses that ever lived. And I promise you, his back's going to be longer than his shoulders or his hip. He's a, big, he's a big long horse. We went and measured him. And he said, now this is lesson one. He measured perfect. I mean, he was, yeah, he was kind of long in the back. But he was just as long in the shoulder and he was just as long in the hip. He measured perfect. And that is what you got to learn. A correct trapezoid comes in big, short, uh, small, it, 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 no matter whether they're big, tall, or what they are, little and short, the balance point has got to be there. Whether it's, uh, so, so you can't, you don't want to let little horses or big horses trick you on this, it, it's, because it, it makes a big difference. And uh, uh, to me, I think that's the most important. I won't even start a horse that doesn't have a good trapezoid. We'll get it broke and send it home or, or sell it to somebody for a trail horse. And then I think the main thing that a horse has to have is a mind and trainability. Uh, I've won a lot of money on horses that weren't the greatest athletes in the world. They were athletic and they were nice horses. But they weren't bionic by any means. But they had them golden minds. They that sweet, sweet, wanted to be trained, wanted to work with you, wanted to help you. That's, I think, I would take that over extremely physical any day. Because you can have the most physical horse in the world, and if he wants to fight and he doesn't want to cooperate, you're never going to be able to get his full potential. But the, the, the truly great horses are the ones that have the physical ability and the mind. And you know, like if you go back to the 60s and 70s, man, if you got a horse like that, that had the physical ability and the mind, it was rare. I mean, it was hard to beat a horse like that because there weren't many of them. And you know, today, 
we've got a lot of good breeding programs out there and people are keeping the very best studs, the, the best-minded studs, the talented studs, the same with the mares. And when I look at the industry today, it's really exciting because there's a smorgasbord of great horses out there. And, and I remember like back in the 60s, there was only about 10 people that were capable of winning the fraternity that could take a horse to that level consistently every year. Today, there are two or three hundred people out there that if you give them the right horse, they would be capable of winning the fraternity. And there's a lot of horses out there that if they're given the same opportunity and trained right, cared for right, that are capable of winning the fraternity. I mean, to me, it's so exciting to see where this come from the 60s to now. And like Dale said back, way back then, that he just didn't think horses could do more. If he could see them today, I mean, it's, it's, it's unbelievable what these horses are doing. And doing it with consistency. And another thing I'm seeing in, in the reining horse industry is horses are lasting longer. They're, a great horse doesn't get used up in a season. A, a great horse, a lot of them are going a long time. Uh, it, it's, uh, and a lot of it is we've got so much smarter. You know, when the West Coast got involved in reining, they brought so much good stuff to the industry. Uh, the schooling, the schooling shows. Like Bobby Avila has a, been a very good friend of mine for many years. And oh, I, I would say, I, I would say it's probably been 25 years ago, at least 24, any, something. he called me up and he said, I've got a youth that wants to go to the Congress. And he said, her horse will be dead ready. She's entered in three classes. Would you take the horse for, her, for me and, and get her in the pen? He said, no, you don't have to school him. All you got to do is keep his face soft and lope him and keep him legged up. Said he's 18 years old. He's got big ankles. You got to ice him when you're done riding him. Uh, he says, other than that, put her on him and put him in the pen. He says, it, she's entered in three classes. If she wants to get in a fourth class, don't let her. He said, I've had him to school and shows. He's got three runs in him, that's it. Well, we, this horse is 18 years old. He was in the snaffle bit fraternity. He was showed as a hackamore as a four-year-old, the bridle as a five-year-old, and been showed every year since. He was an old Fritz command gelding. And we took him and she blew him away. The first class, she blew him away the second. She just barely won the third one. He was starting to rabble a little. And, you know, so Bobby would take him home, back home, and go to some more schooling shows and get him ready for another big event. Well, he'd been doing that for years. And see, now everybody in the industry has learned the importance of schooling shows and that you've got to let these horses, after you take them up to a level, like to go to the fraternity, the NRBC, the Derby, after they've been taken up to a level like that, they have to be brought back down and go to some school of shows and have some relaxing runs. And, and uh, not only the quality of horses that we have today or the quality of trainers, the knowledge we have today. Uh, when the, I think when the West Coast brought their influence, the, mainly they brought the bridle horse and they brought the knowledge of schooling. They, they brought a lot of good stuff to the industry. The East Coast, uh, they brought the smoothness and the finesse. And, the, uh, and when we combined it all together, we had something pretty special.